this is just a quick follow-up video to my last one uh, I had, I'd managed to forget to wanted to put one or two items on and then I found a few more the main one I've forgotten to do was this this when the, at the beginning of the war when the British were looking for a steel helmet this was one of the designs that we that they were looked at but they found it a bit too flimsy too weak but the Portuguese used this this is an original I think it's got this original paintwork on it's got its original liner in the chin straps come a bit loose there but it just wants re sewing in again the, the Portuguese did use Brody helmets as well later on, but they did, they did use a lot of those. And just yesterday, I went to a military fair not far from me, and there's a chap there selling these. These are original First World War postcards, and he was selling them separately. There's about 100 in there, just over 100. And I thought I'd just make him an offer for the whole book, and I got it at a really good price. So they're, they're, all, they're all French ones, they're French postcards from the First World War. Brand real ones and a few more dug up items that's is a horse's bit it's got this it's a brass badge on the side there it's got two cross cannons and a flaming grenade that's french so that, that's for the french artillery then i bought this a while back this is a german bayonet found on the somme and this is a fuse off a, an artillery shell that's a russian one if you look there that little blob on the end that shows it's a russian one and also during the first war the germans experimented with these this is a hand grenade it's called a turtle grenade because the army stick grenades and the English british mills grenades had a, were on a timer if you threw it into an enemy trench they did have time to throw it back so the germans came up with this idea so those little plungers there when it hit anything it went off but there was a problem because <laughs> If the Germans were throwing it and they slipped out of the hand, they dropped to the floor, they blow themselves up. So I don't think they were used very much after the First World War. And this is one of the pretty iconic items. It's the Christmas Mary Christmas tin that was sent out to all the troops. That was, it was inaugurated by Princess Mary. It was her idea and she was going to fund it herself out of her own money. But there's going to be that many soldiers to give it to that a, a committee was set up and took over from her. Inside there'd be a card. That one's actually dated 1915 because there was, you know, they was just too late to get them all out for the first Christmas. And there's a little note in there. It says, "With best wishes for a victorious New Year from the Princess Mary and friends at home." This one's got its actual original content. That's a packet of tobacco and some cigarettes. There's a few gone, but there's some still left in there. That's still all complete. A Princess Mary got that idea from Queen Victoria in the, in the Boer War. She sent chocolate out to all her, her troops on the New Year of 1900. And the chocolate, they asked the, you know, the chocolate making companies in England at the time to supply the chocolate. And they were Jess Fry and Sons, the Cadbury Brothers and the Roundtree Company. But all the owners of those companies were Quakers. So they didn't want to make profit from the war. So they donated all the chocolate for free. Then we've got another item. All British soldiers will have a first aid dressing pouch. That's an original one. It's dated 1916. It's never been used. And then also with the Christmas, the, the New Year gift, there was these called bullet pencils. Bullet pencils as a pencil. They were originally issued to the Royal Navy. And then they were issued to the soldiers as well. The case is actually, they're all made from an actual case that was used somewhere in France. They got that. And then this, and no, it's not for scooping out honey. Every French soldier in the First World War would have one of these. It's actually a sewing kit. All around those grooves there, there would be different colored threads for repairing the uniform. Unscrew this. There's a brad all there. That's for making holes in your leather equipment if that needed repairing. And also, screw on the bottom got needles in there to repair your uniform so every French soldier would have had one of those and also we've got this this is a, another iconic item for the British Army this is the, the rum ration jar the SRD stands for supply reserve depot but knowing the British soldiers they, they had nicknames for it one of them was seldom reaches destination and finally we have this this is a collapsible trench lantern I think it's a a French made one you open it up and get it right how does it work now oh there we go it's a bit complicated give us a minute <coughs> cut that there 
and that all clicks into place then there's a candle in there first the first place is to the light and you've got a trench lantern but then you can fold it up and put it in your backpack and take it away so there you go this is just another quick uniform video this is going to be but the Canadian one that follows this is the last one in the First World War series. After that, I'm going on to the Second World War. Now, in the British Army, pistols were normally just only issued to officers, but others could be issued with them as well. Non-commissioned officers would have them, tank crew and machine gunners. This outfit is made up to a, what a machine gunner may have looked like. The leather jerkin, that came in in the First World War. They usually kept them warm. It had a blanket lining inside for the cold winters. And they were used in the Second World War as well and beyond. And they would wear an open top holster with the revolver in. And the little leather ammunition pouch on the left hand side of the picture, that belonged to my great uncle. He was killed on the 30th of April 1918. And we, we did a bit of a history of him and we found out that about two months before he was killed, he was trained to be a Lewis machine gunner, so we believe he may have looked something like this. There are a lot of impressive monuments to the First World War in France and Belgium but oh my goodness this must be one of the most impressive. It's the Canadian War Memorial on top of Vimy Ridge. It stands on Hill 145 which is the highest point on the ridge and it commemorates 60,000 Canadian soldiers who died in the First World War. It was designed by a chap called Walter S. Allward who was a Canadian artist and sculptor and it was made from special limestone brought in from what is now Croatia. It stands nearly 89 feet tall, that's 27 meters to all you young folk out there. Well we ever changed that, if those measurements were good enough for those people in those days it should be good enough for us. And on the walls are the names of 11,285 Canadians who have no known grave. And also on the monument there are 20 large carved figures all around it. Each one was carved in position from just one piece of stone they put temporary covers over the top so the men could work on them. And the work started in 1925 and it was unveiled in July 1936 by King Edward VIII during his very short reign. At the start of the war the Canadians had developed a set of leather equipment. This was known as the Oliver 1916 pattern. But during training they realised it wasn't going to be suitable for the Western Front. So when the Canadian Army set sail in 1916, they left all this equipment behind and when they got to France they were issued with the 08 pattern cotton equipment. So this leather equipment was never actually used in, in France or Belgium. Now the first item I bought from this was the leather belt. I found this on eBay a few years ago. And when it was delivered, I messaged the seller to see if he had original leather ammunition pouches to go with it. and. Surprisingly enough, he said, yes, I do, actually. And he also had some reproduction leather shoulder straps. So we agreed a price, and it turned out we don't live that far apart from each other. We're about 20 minutes away. So he said he would come down and bring them with him and save on the postage. So, and when we met up, it turns out that he's a collector as well. His, his is all First World War as well. He has a very impressive collection of German pickle hobs and... British metal groupings. His name's Mike and later on as well, a few years, well just earlier this year, he asked did I want to buy this Canadian tunic as well. It is original, it's badged up to a sergeant and if you look on the left sleeve it has two wound stripes. It did have some coloured cloth sh uh, arm badge as well but they were reproduction so I've left those off for now because I just wanted to keep this as a, a fully original uniform and also Mike has a, a Canadian Ross rifle which, which I don't have so he's very kindly offered to let me make a film of it and I'll put it on the end of the video to show you the rifle and also during the First World War the Canadians wore the usual cap like that it was a stiffened top stiffened peak 
This was actually made after the First World War. It's what's known as the 22 pattern. The only difference being the peak on this one is slightly larger than the ones from the First World War. Round the back you can see the broad leather yoke around the shoulders for the shoulder straps. Then the, the water bottle, that's original, but the leather carrying case, that's a replica. Then on the left hand side we have the bayonet for the Ross rifle. In early April 1917, the Allies were planning for the Battle of Arras, and part of the offensive, they needed to take the German positions on top of Vimy Ridge. This job was given to the Canadians. There were four Canadian divisions and one British division. They were under the command of Field Marshal Bing. He was known by his friends as Bungo. And he knew that a lot of the officers would either be killed or wounded, so there was extensive training so all the NCOs and all the men knew exactly where they were going and what had to be done. And two weeks before the offensive started, the Canadian artillery bombarded the German positions to, to try and destroy as much as possible. Then on the 9th of April, which turned out to be very cold with sleet and snow, at 5.30am in the morning the Canadian artillery opened fire. 30 seconds later several mines were detonated underneath the German strong points and then the troops set off under a creeping barrage and by 6.25 a.m. that day the first objective was captured. But it wasn't all easy going, there was a lot of toing and froing, the Germans counter-attacked and like Bing predicted a lot of the officers were killed but the NCOs carried on and moved the men forward and sometimes the men would even go forward on their own because all the train, everybody knew where they were going and what had to be done. But eventually by 6 p.m. on the 12th of April the final objective was, was taken. This was to become a defining moment for Canada and her army and that's why they chose Vimy Ridge for their memorial. So what we have here is a Mark III 1915 dated Canadian Ross service rifle uh, first introduced for the Canadian Defence Force about 1904 and produced from an idea by Colonel Charles Ross and under the blessing of the Defence Minister Sam Hughes. Essentially it was a target rifle, excellent as a target rifle, however less successful as a standard service rifle. A number of problems with it. Far too long, it's far longer than the standard British infantry rifle of the First World War and indeed far longer than the German infantry rifle of the First World War. Unlike the British rifle, it only has a five round magazine. The British SMLE was 10 rounds. And the box magazine that you can see here, which is integral, although reinforced on later marks, was an early flimsier version, which could be dented and stop the rounds from feeding. It was made of very, very high tolerances. So there were numerous problems, not least the problems of dirt. If the weapon wasn't cleaned properly, if there was excess dirt around the mechanism, it wouldn't cycle around in or out of the breech. There was a spring weakness in the magazine itself and initially a flaw in the ejection of the bolt. If it was assembled the wrong way, it could potentially be hazardous to the operator. Its main advantage was that it was what's called a straight pull. In as much as you don't have to cycle the bolt, you just have to pull it backwards. That would eject the round and cycling it forward that will take a round into the breach. Because of its poor performance on the Western Front it was decided that by early 1916 all of them should be withdrawn and they should be replaced by the short magazine Lee Enfield. However they were retained as sniper rifles because of their um, inherent accuracy and numerous ones were sent to Russia in the 1920s and again they were reissued for use by the Home Guard during the Second World War. This is a rare survivor.
as most service rifles were issued with a bayonet, the Ross was no exception. Because of its overall length, it was felt unnecessary to issue a weapon that was similar to the British short magazine Lee Enfield 1907 pattern bayonet with an 18 inch blade. Consequently, this small knife bayonet was developed for use with the Ross rifle. As you can see, it is around a 12 inch blade and is engaged on the bayonet lug and onto the barrel to give an overall length which is well over six feet long. When the weapon was withdrawn in 1916, there was clearly no real use for a bayonet for a rifle that was no longer going to be used as a frontline service weapon. So many of these had their locking catches removed and their upper surfaces ground sharp and they were issued as fighting knives. And that indeed is how you will see many of them for sale at military shows.